So technology and the future of medicine, the course and the reality. Um, it's a year and a half after we conceptualized this course. Quite a lot has, has happened. And uh, it, it's been an interesting kind of journey. It's a journey in, in two ways. One th is that right now, we're teaching the course in the building that is the farthest from the hospital you can po possibly imagine. It's CCIS, it's on the other side of the campus. And uh, so it's a bit of a journey to get there, but uh, it, it, it's well worth it. We are going to stay there because the quality of video and audio that that room over, over in that building is capable of cannot be reproduced apparently in any of the rooms of this building or anything over on this side of uh, the campus. Um, so what's the course about? Now you may feel some internal struggle because you may not agree with the basic construct behind what's on this slide and that's what the course is about. The slide is about the fact that humans and machines are kind of competing, and that by about 2045, machines will be smarter than human beings are, will take over the future agenda of the world, and the only way that human beings can know and understand what's going on is by cooperating or merging with those machines in some way. Now you may not believe that. It's actually comforting not to believe it. It's very comforting to believe the world you experience today is gonna to be more or less the same the rest of your life, because that would make things really easy, make planning really simple. And so if you happen to hold that belief, you may find it softening a little bit during the course of this talk, because I'll bring some other evidence to the, the idea that this is going to happen. So that's basically what the course is about, but you can't put the word singularity in the course name because nobody knows what that means. And it's also interesting, some of the people who don't know what it means don't want to learn, okay? <laughs> so it's not like everybody is saying, well, gee, I'm really eager. And some of them sense that whatever this means is something that they're not particularly wanting to think about right now. So if you find yourself in that category, it's okay. It's sort of normal to react like that. Um, but anyway, it, it, it comes from the analogy of black holes in physics and the uh, event horizon that surrounds a black hole and what happens once you enter a black hole. That's a singularity in physics. And the idea is the same sort of thing would occur here. That we would not recognize the world and in fact not with our unaided brains be able to recognize the world after this happens. Will it be in 2045? We don't know for certain but the thing about that is it's only 32, 33 years from now, and most of the young people sitting in these seats will be still active and working at that time. So you will experience it, and if what I tell you today bears no resemblance to what happens in 2045, well, you'll know that. Or if it does bear some resemblance, maybe this talk today will, will help you somewhat in preparing for the future. So if you didn't know anything about the singularity before February 2011, that's fine. There was nothing in the mainstream media that would inform you about it prior to that time. But two very important things happened in February 2011. First of all, the idea of the technological Singularity, the, the idea of um, us becoming immortal by merging with uh, machines, appeared on the cover of Time magazine. And secondly, in the game show Jeopardy, a computer, Watson, won on the show against the top human contenders and won so convincingly 
then it's clear that this wasn't just a fluke, that if you had allowed the computer to continue to play, he would have won against every conceivable human competitor. He never would have lost. He got better, or I say he, might have been a she. Anyway, the computer got better and better over the three days and reached a level of playing that no human would ever be able to reach. So from that moment on then, uh, computers were better than human beings at the game of Jeopardy, just like some year years ago, computers became better than human beings at chess, and you know it's also happened in checkers, and Jonathan Schaefer, the current uh, dean of science, is the person who solved checkers with a complete solution so that no human being could ever win against a uh, computer playing checkers. And, and he's also uh, dealt with many other uh, games, and he, he uh, contributed to the, the team that I actually solved chess uh, when that happened. So a few months later then, I began planning this course, and we had focus groups for both undergraduate and graduate students. Some of you were in those groups, and uh, Ashlyn Bernier was in one of the groups, and she later on ended up taking the course. And there's a student uh, testimonial from her on the very front page of the website for the course. There's another uh, physics PhD student who has recently given a much more detailed testimonial uh, critique. Um, we made a lot of changes in the plans for the course based on these two focus groups. Um, and some of the things that we were told by the students are really quite important in the way that we uh, conduct the course. I said, is there a limit to how much bad news you want to hear? <laughs> should we like protect you? Should, should we try to have it balanced so there's like more positive stuff than negative stuff so you, you, you feel very confident and uh, optimistic about the future? And the students said, no, we don't want to be protected. We want you to, as, as well as you can, tell us everything that you know, both good and bad, about what the future is likely to be like. They, they also felt that the teaching session should be open to the public. There should be no limit to who was there. And it was just fine to mix a kind of hospital round setting with people just showing up to listen to the lectures with students taking the, the, the course for uh, a grade. So that's what we currently do. And we, we've had up to about uh, 25 people sitting in the seats. Only a small proportion of them are actually taking the course for uh, a grade. Often the best and most insightful comments come from the people who are taking it for uh, uh, CPL, Continuous Professional Learning. But it's interesting also the uh, competition. The um, quality of the student presentations was very high. Everybody commented on how serious the students seemed about them. And, and I think the, the students also put a lot of time in, into uh, preparing very good questions for each uh, teaching session. So we responded in many ways to the input that we received from the uh, focus groups. You know, most of you probably know, that it takes 14 months from proposal to the time that you can actually teach a course and have it in the paper catalog of uh, the university. So we fast paced this um, in many ways. So we had these focus groups in May, we had the, pro the proposal in June, and we started teaching the course as a CPL course in September. No, nobody was taking it then for uh, a grade. But um, that worked very well. So we, in essence, had a kind of dry run for the course before the first time it was taught as a regular university uh, graduate course in January of 2012. So it's taught both terms. 
It's open to both undergraduate and graduate students. Initially, there was a glitch in the system, not a very bad glitch. It's actually a favorable glitch, where uh, undergraduates could just go in and register. There was no barrier. Well, of course, that's not how it's supposed to work. So, so now, if you're an undergraduate and go in and try to register, you get a notice saying you have to contact me. And then I uh, interview the student to make sure they have the uh, uh, maturity to take the course. We talk a lot about ethics and the philosophy. If you think of you know, 12 to 15 year olds that you know, they may not have much time for ethics and philosophy, and then at some time, they stop feeling uh, immortal, begin thinking deep thoughts, <laughs> they could begin to consider these things. So you can't tell by a person's age uh, whether they're ready for a course like this. We've had students as young as 17 taking it. There's a young man, Stefan, who um, shadowed me one day at the hospital, learned about the course, began uh, coming to it, and he will essentially keep coming to it uh, forever, I think. He's now an, uh, a first-year uh, undergraduate. And because you can't have a course about the future that stays static, if the course is about the future, it has to constantly reinvent itself to remain relevant. So that's what we do, and it means that people who keep coming to the course over and over get new ideas, new uh, content. We have broadcast quality uh, video that we're shooting. Obviously, it would be very boring for us to do the same thing twice. And what, what I would challenge you, if you're interested in how this is possible to keep changing things, Jonathan White's first lecture that's on the very center of the main uh, web page for the course, which is just www.singularitycourse.com. And um, if you listen to that lecture, it, it's really a r riveting experience. You'll find yourself unable to stop watching it for the hour. And that's even though we left out the song <laughs> that he uh, had when he first presented it. And you, you might say, okay, well, if he's gonna talk about the same subject, he couldn't possibly do it without overlapping the content a lot. So it must be if I've heard it once that I'd be really bored by the second and third time. The, his other two lectures are also on uh, YouTube. And you'll be absolutely amazed that they're just as riveting, just as you know, engaging as, as the first one. And the content is not the same. He changes the point of view. He changes a lot of things every time. And so um, it's, it's, it's really an interesting challenge for us having people come back and listen to this for a second term, a third term, and, and thinking of how to keep it exciting for them and for us and realizing that that's legitimately how the course should be anyway. Now over the time, our, our course sessions have developed a kind of pedagogical rhythm and in the beginning, we had all sorts of theories about how, how the timing should work, but it seems to just naturally come down to this. That I give a 10-minute uh, intro, e even if I'm not the main speaker, then the main speaker speaks for 45 to 50 minutes. And following that, we have approximately 20-minute uh, discussion. And that seems to work very well. Often, the 20-minute discussion is the best part. And so if you think, if you're shooting broadcast quality videos, why don't the students just stay home? Why would they ever come to the face-to-face -face lecture? Well, it's because they want to take part in that you know, 20 minute discussion and it's really exciting to do so. So we don't have too much problem with people just staying home and watching the videos. You know in this era of massive online uh, open courses, that many of those courses, for instance, the AI course that uh, Sebastian Thrun was, was teaching at uh, Stanford, when he started putting it online, the 200 students that had been coming before dwindled to 35 to 40. And he asked them, why? Why are there so few of you? 
They said, honestly, sir, you're better on video. You're much better on video. And you know, we can watch you in our pajamas. You know, we, we, we don't have to get ready. So that's why this is, this is happening. But that's not a phenomenon that we have really faced. Now, look at this picture of Osmer Zayan. It's a pretty good picture. And it is um, not a picture that a human being could easily take. Think about this. If you said to, to Osmer now, Osmer, put your hands over your head. I'm going to take your picture. He, he, he'd look sort of weird, right? This is a spontaneous gesture. And how did we capture it? It was captured by that camera there that has a software algorithm for what uh, interesting pictures are. So it you know, identifies a face. It's good if there's a smile, if, if the face is sort of central, and all sorts of things that determine what, by software rules, an uh, interesting picture is. And those of you who know about my Facebook page for the course and so on, You'll, you'll recognize there are a lot of very good pictures there. They are almost all taken by a machine. They're not taken by, with any human intervention. So you see, uh, Akshatha's here, she's tending the video, but she's not taking the individual pictures. The individual pictures are based on what the software inside the camera thinks is a um, an interesting picture. Now the other side of that, okay, so sometimes we end up with hundreds of pictures from one lecture. Sometimes we end up with one, right? <laughs> there have been occasions where I take, take a camera to something in the evening and the camera decides there's only one picture worth taking, which has become my new uh, definition of a really dull evening, right? If the camera can't find anything interesting. But it, it shows you in ways you never imagined that computers are out-competing human beings right now, even in something as simple as the taking of pictures. <clears throat> now, we, we are quite proud that we have uh, diverse faculty from uh, across the, the campus teaching in the course. When uh, Heather Graves in, in English and film um, studies first started to teach in the course, she was certain that she was a doomed faculty member, that she had gotten into the course by accident, and we would never, ever ask her back, because she just didn't fit, because, you know, we were all scientists and doctors there. And she was so astounded when we asked her back and asked her back uh, again. Leslie uh, Cormack had, had the same question. She said, well, but I don't even know what the singularity is. How can I possibly contribute? I said, but you know a lot about history and you're one of the leaders in the university. And you, you'll find, I think, if you listen to her uh, lecture on YouTube, no matter what your background is, it's fascinating. What she says is that in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, the medical system that existed then was really as complete as the one we have now. You may argue that it didn't work as well. Well, may, may, maybe that's so, but most anything that somebody felt that there was that was wrong with them, they had a name for it. They had a way to identify it. You know, there's a there's a demon inside you. Whatever you you like spell has been cast on you. Various things we don't believe in anymore. And therapies, some of which have you know, later on developed into therapies we use now, and some of, of which we don't think were ever of any value. But the fact is, living at that time, people believed that they had a complete system. And they could tell you about all the aspects of it, just like we can now. And so this whole idea of living in the dark is, is a very interesting concept. When you think about the stealth fighter, right, for uh, 15 to 17 years, people worldwide didn't know that stealth technology existed. The military knew, we didn't know. Then suddenly we knew. We may not know everything about it, but at least we, we, we knew that there is such a thing. Do you think we're in the dark like that for many other things? Would it bother you if there are a whole bunch of other things that you don't know exist in the world because you're 15 to 17 years behind the military? 
Well, of course, for a large part of human civilization, the average person has known practically nothing about what's going on. They've never met any of the leaders. They had no way to see what they looked like. They knew very little about why taxes were being uh, collected, a whole bunch of things. But it actually protected you not to know, because if somebody in a leadership position back in those days decided to kill off you know, opponents, you only needed to kill off the ones who actually knew what was going on. And that group was so small, kind of protected the rest of the people. So these are some of the kinds of insights that we got from Leslie um, Cormack. It was as relevant to the course as anything else. And um, I think it was surprising to her, and, and uh, yet it, it kind of provided the sort of balance we need in the course. And what about this song that Jonathan uh, White began his lecture with, and why did we take it out? Well, we didn't want to go to jail. Or <laughs> The songs are copyright, they have ownership. If you take the entire vocals and you know, musical part and all the lyrics of a song, just put it up on YouTube, that's not legal. As exciting and wonderful as it might be to, to do that. So he started out with this song, which, which was great to hear and it was, it was a fine way to begin a lecture. But because none of us owned the rights to the song, we stripped it off, so that's why when you watch his video, you think, I wonder why he began like that. It's a very odd beginning. It's so abrupt. Well, that's because there's another part with the song that we have removed. Uh, it, it's very interesting musical artist who, who, who does many songs about future subjects. Now, what do you know about human motivation and what's normal? And what do you think secretly motivates you? Like when you hear this guy, Kim Solas, tell you that, gee, it'd be really interesting for you to go to a course in CCIS L1160, and you're at the university hospital, well, what does this mean to you? Well. <laughs> About 90 to 95% of human beings, normal human beings, are motivated by comfort and security. So if it's minus 40 out, and Dr. Solez is asking you to, to walk to CCIS L1160 and you're not feeling like it, that's actually normal. So it's, it's not like you should feel really guilty. The other motivations in life, people who are motivated by you know, success, by trying to change the world, that's really unusual. There are very few people honestly motivated by that. A lot of people appear to be because comfort and security can come with success or can come with changing the world, but very few people would say, yes, I'm gonna walk to the other side of campus just because I feel I must do that. So, what are the other options? Well, this is kind of uh, amusing, but it's true. Any time, any day, that you drive along Saskatchewan Drive on the other side of campus, close to CCIS, there are always parking places. It doesn't matter what the circumstance is. It doesn't matter what's going on. It's always a place to park, right in front of the main door of the building. Now, why is that? It's because, in the opinion of many people, those parking meters are so expensive that they ever park there and they never want to park there again. So people avoid parking in the, where you pay, I don't know, four, 4 50 an hour because they feel resentful about the cost. But you can go there and park and there's always parking. I don't care, day or night or the day or whatever's happening, there's always parking. If you felt that it's causing you an internal angst that you're paying the $4 and yet you really want to go to our course, we'll make a deal for you. We'll cover the parking. How's that, eh? <laughs> So you really don't have an excuse and you don't have to walk there if you don't want to and I'll still respect you if you never ever walk there if you always go by car. 
Even though you could walk with these people, it's an awesome experience, they're fun to get to know, and they know all the best routes, I guess. <laughs> okay, uh, so the pilgrimage. All right, what else about the course? So we're shooting broadcast quality video of each lecture and discussion. We say we endeavor. What does that mean? That means if we have somebody who's really excited about teaching and wandering all over the room, we don't get very good video, just like I've just gotten out of the video here. So it depends upon how much I'm able to influence the behavior of the individual lecturer, whether we always get broadcast quality video. There, there are separations between the parts of the wallboard in the room. If a person stands where that separation is very obvious, you don't get the pure white uh, background. So there are many other things that determine that quality, but at least potentially we are now routinely shooting broadcast quality uh, video and audio. You can watch most of the previous lectures on uh, YouTube at these two channels, Kim Sola's and Avoca 99. Um, and the students taking the course are graded in, in, in three things up until now, and based on their input, there will be four, four in the future. So up until now, they've been graded on a paper and a presentation and on a critique of a previous lecture. So they take the PowerPoint or the YouTube video from a previous lecture and they critique it. Now, how are we able to do that, and why isn't this popular in most courses? Most courses are taught by one particular department, and the people in that department are subtly competing with each other in all sorts of ways. So you don't want to ask the students to critique the lectures, because say that all the students critique one person's lecture. Well, that person's status goes down in the department compared to everybody else. It's a nightmare, right? We don't have that at all. None of the people teaching in this course are competing with any of the others. We have people from all different faculties, from all different uh, life experiences you can imagine, with people from the Nanotech Institute and from the fa Faculty of Arts, Faculty of Science, and so on. Nobody's competing with anybody else, so it's completely safe to ask the students to tell us how can we improve the lectures. And it's really fun to do that. And we, we, there's the, that's an important part of how we make changes from year to year. Now on the 4th of December, we had a five hour session in this room. <laughs> Not this room, actually, the mirror image of this room, 4.30 rather than 4.20. So we had the five student presentations, we had a special lecture by uh, Cybera CEO Robin Windsor, and we had the premiere of the song that I played you at the beginning. Um, and um, it was really interesting to, to see how the students at the end of that time, you'd think they'd be completely exhausted and just looking at their watches and wanting to leave the room, but no, actually, at the end of the formal session, they wanted to talk with me about the course, and it was great. So one of the suggestions that they made was that we should give them some grade on classroom participation. Even though I, I said, but I want you to feel that you don't have to be there if you don't want to. He said, we know that, but actually the classroom discussion is so important and so, so exciting, it just seems logical that we should be graded for it in some way. So we're also going to have an online forum, so if we ever get a shy student who's not comfortable talking in class, they would have some other way to do the same thing, so we will give 10% uh, uh, of marks in the future, starting this uh, January to classroom uh, participation. Um, there's no required reading. What does that mean? It means each student can f pursue whatever areas of special interest to them. They can do a lot of reading in that. If they want, they can do no reading in other areas that are less interesting. Um, what is the course content? The course content is what I told you about in that first slide, the technological singularity, the idea 
that machines will become smarter than we are, take over the agenda of what's going on in the world, and we can only then understand what's going on by combining or uh, um, merging with them in some fashion from that point on. It's about uh, existential risks, all sorts of different ways in which our species could end. Things like gray goo in uh, nanotech, uh, nano uh, particles that eat all carbon forms. You can think of all sorts of very scary things that could occur that represent uh, existential risks. We also talk about ways to optimize a positive outcome for uh, humanity in this uh, co-evolution of humans and uh, machines and the influence of these considerations on medicine of the future. This past term, we had the Dean of Science and the Dean of Arts speaking. We have many prominent people taking part uh, internationally by Skype. Now when that happens, the students are able to come down front and talk directly with these people on Skype. And they, they, they describe this as a very exciting thing. The lectures themselves are pre-recorded, so the quality is very high. So it's not that we're getting the lecture by Skype, it's the post-lecture discussion that we do by Skype. And the other thing we're very proud of is that we have a balanced view due to incorporation of both technology skeptics and technology advocates. Which category would you guys be in? Now, if you think about that question, you realize you don't really accept being in either one of those pure categories. And in fact, most people aren't. And what happens in the course, which is wonderful for us to see, is we pick people because they seem like the quintessential technology skeptics. They hardly ever check their email. They're always complaining about technology. They walk around with, if you can believe it, only one device in their pockets or possibly none. Who ever heard of such a thing? You know, it's scary, right? And yet, during the course of, of taking part in these teaching sessions, they become fascinated by various technology subjects. They start sending the rest of us email about all sorts of high-tech stuff. Meanwhile, the so-called technology advocates learn a lot about real life from these so-called technology skeptics. Learn about such things as karma and the idea that if you suddenly become lame, if you start limping, could be if something that happened up to seven generations back in your family, that maybe your ancestor was out hunting and he wounded an animal, didn't track it down and kill it, and because of this, you now have to suffer for what your ancestor did. A very, very interesting concept, the idea that life is cyclical. There are all sorts of things that you probably never thought, thought about, that are part of sort of uh, you know traditional ideas that are all also worth thinking about. Do, do the other two uh, ever come together? Well, yes. There is uh, a story that one of our lecturers, Bibiana Kujek, a cardiologist, tells the story. She's climbing in the uh, Himalayas, and there's a porter who doesn't speak English, who is helping them in this climb. A group of cardiologists. Cardiologists have everything. They have ambu bags, they have medication, they have oxygen with them. Everything you can imagine the cardiologist might want to be really happy, they have. Okay, so one of the porters begins to feel ill. He tells his fellow porters that he's, he's not feeling well. Would they accompany him? He wants to go to this place nearby, and he says, leave me here. I think it's my time. And the following morning, he's dead. The following morning, it's clear that he died of cardiac disease and he had pulmonary edema and he died. And so from our Western point of view, this is something awful. If only they had let the cardiologists know, they all would have rushed in and saved the guy. From the, but from the karma point of view, this is probably exactly it's the ideal way for the guy to die, for the guy to, to, to pass into the next life. He was conscious, he felt this was his time. You know, everything was sort of working out. If we'd rushed in with Western medicine and tried to save him, it could have screwed up his karma big time, right? 
So there are two ways to look at that. And it's imagine, it, it, it really broadens the mind to, to kind, of, kind of expand your thinking like that. The university, as you know, has signed a memorandum of understanding with Udacity. This is very important. Uh, uh, Udacity is probably the best entity out there providing MOOCs, massive open online courses. And uh, so I imagine there will eventually be some relationship between uh, Udacity and the course that we teach. And if you look at the Udacity website, they are doing one thing that we're not doing, which is really fascinating to watch. This is this beautiful script with uh, partial uh, transparency where you see the hand, but you see other things superimposed on the hand. That's done by writing on a graphics tablet. Right now, we don't have anybody in the course teaching using that um, uh, device, but we plan to in the next year. Now, you may wonder, what's the relationship between this course and the other singularity entities out there? Singularity University, Singularity Summit, uh, Singularity Institute, blah, 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 on and on, Singularity Hub. Well, before last week, that would have been a very complicated question. In fact, I wouldn't even put it in here because it would just take me too long to explain. But on the 6th, Singularity University that had already acquired the Singularity Hub acquired the other entities. So they now own Singularity Summit and they own the, the name Singularity Institute and, and so on and so forth. And so it's quite exciting. Suddenly, starting a week ago, we're almost the only completely independent entity out there. Everybody else is owned by the Singularity University enterprise. And okay, now, you, you've had a while to think about this idea of human. So do you know about Foxconn? If you have an iPad or an iPhone, it was almost certainly made in the Foxconn uh, factories in China. And so are a lot of other non-Apple devices. And you may know that one sort of mini scandal is that Foxconn workers, many of them have you know, committed suicide. They're, it seems like it's not a very happy place to work. So what Foxconn decided was they have a staff of 1.2 million workers, and they have decided to replace 1 million of them with 1 million robots. They're starting that right away. The first uh, uh, 10,000 robots um, arrived last week, and they plan to complete this within three years. So all of these million people will lose their jobs and be replaced permanently by robots that are cheaper, that work around the clock, that don't make any unreasonable demands, that don't threaten to uh, commit suicide if they're mistreated. It's just, so, and, and this is, uh, Something you, you can read about in multiple places, and it certainly happened, and I think it would change your idea of, of you know, what's happening in the world. Um, so if you think back to medicine, you can imagine in the future of medicine, we could eliminate all disease and still have a terrible, terrible world. Um, you can imagine a world in which humans just don't matter. If you passed some lowly insect on the way here, an ant or something, it's not that you disliked the ant, you just didn't care, right? You weren't concentrating, you, 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 didn't, you, didn't, you hardly even thought about it. Well, machines may eventually think about us that way, that we're just beneath notice, you know? It would be very sad. And that's worse, really, than, be, than the idea of unfriendly artificial intelligence, to be completely ignored, to realize that human lives now lack significance entirely, would, would, would be a very scary thing. And this general question 
of what our lives in the future will be like is something we are able to shape, we are able to influence. And by talking about this, by teaching about this, by learning about this, by sharing ideas about it, we can help shape the way the future will be. We're not just passive victims of the future. We can actually help determine what that future will be. So the future is ours to shape. It, it's good to get busy doing that. You can imagine a future where all the diseases we know today have been eliminated, but there are even more diseases that are all man-made and all a part of bioterrorism. Um, and you can also uh, imagine that, that, that the future focus of medicine can become uh, enhancement of human uh, capability rather than uh, disease. As I said, the proposed date of the singularity is only 32, 33 years ago. From now, many of the young people in this room will certainly be around and active and still working or doing whatever one does at that time. There may not be work. Um, so um, there, there may be a lot of challenges in response to both the threat of bio Terrorism in the new world where we're making organs from stem cells, the focus of medicine may no longer de be disease but enhancement. And um, it would extend beyond the physical to the moral. So we don't think about that too much today. But actually the idea of the social responsibility of medicine, which also informs a lot of what we're doing in the new medical school in uh, Nepal that many of you know that I'm, I'm involved in. Um, it, social responsibility of medicine is an important aspect of medicine and something we, we talk about a lot in the course. Now, Rudolf Virchow, it's kind of fun to talk about him because almost everybody knows something about Virchow. But did you know this? I don't know how many of you are 27 or recently 27 or about to be 27, but think about this. Most of Virchow's quotes are shown with a picture of Virchow as an old man, but most of those quotes were written when he was 27, and that's pretty cool. I don't know if, if that picture is, is, is close to what he looked like then, but um, the, it, it's, it's really interesting. All these things that he wrote about the social responsibility of medicine were written at that age. It is the curse of humanity that it learns to tolerate even the most horrible situations by habituation. Physicians are the natural attorneys of the poor and the social problems should largely be solved by them. So you know, um, <laughs> I'm just going to skip through these because I, I do want to leave some. How, how did I come to do this? Well, it had to do with uh, the, when I first came to Canada, I did something called the Future Pathology Laboratory Medicine in Canada Consortium. I, I was in charge of that, which kind of visioned the future of laboratory medicine and, and came out with a report in 94. Victor Tron, when he was the new chairman, suggested that I broaden my interest from kidney to sort of all of medicine, to go from cyber nephrology to cyber medicine, and he encouraged medical uh, humanitarian ventures. A lot of stuff in Nepal, a lot of video blogs. I went to Singularity University. See how fast all this can go? <laughs> I've argued for cross-disciplinary structures and it finally became apparent that just arguing for, for them didn't make much sense because I was a full-time university faculty member and why didn't I make it happen rather than waiting for somebody else to make it happen. So that's the reason we created the course. Um, and Moore's Law that many of you know is the idea behind uh, exponential change probably doesn't work entirely well in medicine and the reason have, has to do with regulatory oversight, natural conservatism of medicine, different financial rewards, and the fact that security always trumps uh, information sharing in medicine. So the other funny thing, many of you 
would know that there are thousands of medical apps. Most physicians don't use a single one. So there's a complete out of syncness between medical apps and the people using them. And for instance, on my iPad, I have like, I don't know, 280 apps. I, I used to have a bunch of medical ones which I never use. Now I only have one. Jonathan White's app, uh, Surgery 101, is the only medical app that I use. We're all familiar with the microscope as the symbol of our specialty. I don't know what a mega macroscope would look like, but we have to also think about how to look at the really big picture. We know how to look at the little picture, how to greatly magnify something very small. We're good at that. In order to make a success of laboratory medicine in the future, we also have to do the opposite. We have to somehow figure out what's happening in the great big world out there. What is the big picture? How can laboratory physicians be in charge of the medicine of the future? It is possible, just like I said in 1994, it's possible, it's still possible now. And that's an important uh, consideration. So I welcome your suggestions, and I think we have about a minute for questions. So Michael told me to finish before 10 of, and I did, but it's, it's only a minute before. Yeah, so Tito's talking about Ross Lockwood, and, and he has done a 25-minute um, uh, critique of, of the course, and he's begun a research collaboration with uh, Tito as a direct output of the course, and, and, and we hope to see, see that a lot. I think Fiona had a question? Yeah, I was going to just uh, stick my oar in and um, say that one of your goals was to optimize the co-evolution of uh, humans with machines. So I'd like to argue that uh, given the youth of the uh, human species, the machine is going to evolve a lot more quickly than uh, the human brain is. Yes. And I think it could be to the detriment of humans. Yes. Well, I, I think we will be augmented by, you know, machines, and that's the way that we'll keep up. If, if you're familiar with video games and multi-boxing, multi-boxing is a way that you control many different characters at the same time. We could use this extra intellect that we get from the machine implant to be able to run multiple lives at, at once. It might be a solution to many things. Right now, where there's only one of us, and we're all only able to do one thing at a time, so that might change. And I think we, we have to get out of here, or we're in deep, deep trouble. So.